Well, welcome back. It's hard to believe we're still in Psalm 139. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. Uh, we're going to be looking specifically at uh, verses 21 and 22 of Psalm 139. Uh, and I hope you've been enjoying these studies. I have been enjoying them. I love Psalm 139. Hope you get that uh, from watching them. Uh, but just truly, uh, I think it's a powerful chapter. Uh, that speaks to us. Uh, and by the way, let me just say, we're going to be looking at another hard passage uh, today, but we'll see what God has in store for us. So again, Psalm 139, uh, 21 and 22 we'll be looking at. But I also want you to grab your Bibles while you've got them uh, and turn ex to Exodus 20, verse 7, Exodus 20, verse 7, and then Proverbs 29, uh, verse 27. So Exodus 20, verse 7, and then Proverbs 29, uh, verse 27. While you're getting that, let me read to you. Hymn of the Church. I don't think I've ever read this one. I don't even know that I've, I've read this to our Sunday school class yet. But it's one that I do think when you when we get into the lesson uh, today, uh, I think it will um, speak to you and I. It's called Rescue the Perishing. So listen to this. Rescue the Perishing. This was written, by the way, it's one of the Fanny Crosby's uh, hymns. And it was written in 1869. But rescue the perishing, listening to the, listen to the words. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one. Lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus, the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with him earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, Feelings lie buried that grace can restore, touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness. Chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer, a savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. I don't know about you, but that was a song that I grew up that was sung a lot in my church. I sang this song a lot of missionary meetings, I remember. But it was it's a song that's a very poignant reminder that for a couple things. One, there are the lost. There are those that are perishing. They are. And that the church, the family of God, needs to be mindful of that. And not only that there are the lost, but that we've got the answer. We've got the cure. We've got what they need. We've got the remedy. We've got it. And we've got a duty to take it. And by the way, let me rephrase that. I don't like that word. Not a duty, but a privilege. A privilege. And I think Fanny Crosby's hymn is one that talks about the privilege. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Now with that in mind, or keep that in mind as we move into verse 21 of Psalm 139. And as we said last week, we kind of entered a, a hard passage of Psalm 139, and we're going to continue this week in a hard passage of 139. Uh, but keep that rescue the perishing in the back of your mind as we go into this. So we're going to do verse 21 and verse 22. And before we get into kind of a breakdown of uh, kind of maybe uh, a review, let's have Miss Tori read verse 21 and verse 22. Miss Tori. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? and abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Yikes.
Wow. We've talked about Psalm 139. Psalm 139 is a, it's a fascinating psalm because to me you have a range of emotions. You have on the one hand this psalm that starts off with search me, O God. That God, your ways are too wonderful for me. That, oh God, I can't get away from you. That God, your thoughts are precious to me. God, when I look at how my how I was created, and I understand how wonderfully made that I am, and all of that is due to you. And then it talks about God's thoughts and how precious your thoughts are to me. And then last week we went into, oh God, but this issue of the wicked that's out there. And we dealt with that last week. If only God. This idea of slaying the wicked. We talked about the righteousness of God. We talked about the judgment of God. Um, but we also change kind of the if only in, in our perspective. But now all of a sudden we move right from that into this week. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? Now, let's just say this. It would be very easy for us to say, Hate in the Bible often means a choice, and that is true. You look in the Old Testament when God says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. It was not talking about that he hated, that he had a visceral hatred for Esau. What he was saying was that Jacob was the promised line. Jacob was the one that he was going to use. It was going to be through Jacob that Israel would come into existence. It would be through Jacob that the Messiah would come. And so God is saying there's two twins there that on the one hand, it's just it's a positional relationship. Jacob is the one that I have chosen to be the one through whom I'm going to bless the world. So Jacob, I have loved Esau. I have hated, meaning I have not chosen him. I like this. So I'm going to choose him. I'm not choosing this, not because he did something wrong, but positionally, I've chosen this. I've loved this. And they're far for by default. I've hated this. I'm not, I'm not going to pick that. Let's say this. I think there's certainly a portion of that here. But I think there's also a portion that's not. And I think that there is this aspect of, and let's just say this, within the church, this aspect of, or the concept of hate, we've got to be very careful of. And yet it's in this psalm. It comes after last week we dealt with, if only God, you would slay the wicked. Away from me, you bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil and tender. Adversaries misuse your name. It's a Miss Tori, read 21 and 22 again, Miss Tori. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. This aspect, I think it's in one scripture, it says, uh, almost, I hate them with a perfect hatred. It's interesting when you think about that. A perfect hatred. They don't seem to go together, do they? When we think of hatred, we don't think of that being perfect at all. We think of it as being totally negative, And yet, within Scripture, it says, a perfect hatred. Now, let's deal with this concept of hatred. Verse 21 says, do I not hate those who what? Who hate you? So let's just say this. You and I want to be very careful here that what the psalmist is saying here is already the foundation of everything that's going on here is those that are in open rebellion against God. The psalmist has been one that has already talked about the goodness of God, the blessings of God, the, the delight that is found in God. And we dealt with a little bit last week that you and I need to understand that apart from God, there is no life. There's only one life giver. We were created in the image of God and God breathed into us life. Anything apart. It's why God says, I set before you in the Old Testament to, to the nation of Israel. I set before you life and death. If you choose life, if you choose me, you get life. If you don't choose me, then by default, you've chosen the opposite of life. And the opposite of life is death. I've set before you blessings. Or here's curses. Choose Blessings all along, God is saying, choose life, choose blessings. And yet what we see here, the foundation here that you and I need to understand, even before we get into hate, is this aspect that the foundation of this is those that hate God, those that do not want to live according to his ways, those that take delight 
in flaunting it and mocking him to those of us that are so that God is so precious to. And let's just say this to me, the psalmist is just being very real, kind of at a gut level of his thoughts towards the wicked, towards those that are in open rebellion against God, that flaunt it. He's not saying to these that are seeking, to those that are unsure, to those that are trying to figure out. And you and I need to understand that. What he is saying here, do not I hate those who hate you. They are open they are openly defying you, God. Do I not hate them? Hate what they've become. I see the damage that they're doing. And yet, let's just say this. These are harsh words. And it's in Scripture. And he says, do I not hate those who hate you? And abhor, another word for abhor would be loathe. Loathe those who are in what? Rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. I told you earlier about a couple scriptures. Turn your Bibles to Exodus 20, verse 7. And if you go back to Exodus 20, verse 7, this is what God says. God says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Let me read that again. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Meaning what? That the things of God are to be important and are to be treated reverently. Even God's name is to be treated with respect and reverently. And by the way, let's just say this. Many times the church will use this against the world. Judgment always needs to start at the house of God. That while we many times may not use God's name in vain the way we think that the world does by literally using it, calling it out. You and I need to understand, if we are called by God and we proclaim that we are children of God, that we proclaim that we live under the name of God, then we better make sure our lives are in accordance with that. Or if not, we are bringing shame to the name of God. It is seemingly in vain. So judgment needs to start here. However, what God is saying here is that the things of God, even his name, matter and need to be treated with respect, and need to be treated reverently. Now, if you take that and you look at then, in Proverbs 29, 27, so jump ahead to Proverbs 29, 27. This is interesting here. It says this, An unjust man is abominable to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. So let me read that again. This word abominable. Not a word we hear often, is it? But it says, an unjust man. What's another word for that? A wicked. Those that aren't living lives of holiness. Those that are mocking God and living openly defiant lives against God. An unjust man is abominable to the righteous. And he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. What is that saying? This helps to bring some clarity, I think, to these two verses here. What he's saying is that here, an unjust man and the righteous, they're oil and water. They don't mix. They don't. Now, that doesn't mean that the church can't love the wicked. We're called to love. God, by his very nature, is love. For God so loved the special people, the church, only those that would pick him? No. No. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. The world. That's the nature of God. That's the heart of God. That's what comes from the thoughts of God. For God is love. God does love. But at the same time, as we read in Exodus, God is saying, there are the things of holiness. There are the things that are right and that are to be revered. And God is one of them. God is the thing to be revered. And he's saying here in Proverbs that the wicked, the unjust man, is abominable, does not mix with the righteous. That 
they are opposite extremes. They, 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 they can't blend together. They, they can't agree. It's impossible. And then he goes on and says, and he who is upright in the way, I like that. He who is upright in the way. Meaning what? The righteous. Again, not, not good in two shoes. Not look how perfect we are. No, but he who is upright. We're upright in the way by what? By we've accepted the plan of salvation. We've accepted the gift of salvation. We've asked God to forgive us for our sins. We've asked him to come in, cleanse our hearts and our minds, sanctify us, uh, free us from our sin, help us to lead lives of holiness. Again, doesn't mean that we become perfect. We're not, we don't become robots. But lead us in lives of holiness. And he's saying to those people that live those way, they are abominable to the wicked. They don't gel. We can't. And when you and I understand that verse, it helps us to then appreciate, I think, verses 21 and 22 here, that it's an impossibility that while we're called to love the ways of the world, the wickedness of the world, we, have, we, we can't love that. We can't. We can't love that. You know, it's been said many times that we hate the sin but love the sinner. I'll be honest with you. I think many times in the church, we do the opposite. We hate the sinner, but we love the sin. Meaning this, we live vicariously through the lives of sinners. Oh, now, we really don't want anything to do with them because they're sinners. But we live vicariously through their sin. And it's really the opposite. It's a matter of hating the sin. Understanding that sin and holiness do not go together. They don't gel. They don't mix. They will always separate. Like oil and water. You can try to shake them up. But when you stop it, you'll see it instantly. They go to the shepherd ways. And that's what happens. And so here the psalmist is saying, do I not? I hate those who hate you, Lord. We don't gel. They represent everything that you're not. So by default, God, I have a visceral feeling towards them. Again, you and I understand. God doesn't say that we say it to hate, but it's this visceral feeling that the psalmist is just being very honest here. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? And look, those who are in rebellion against you, those who are in rebellion, that they know what they're doing. Again, not the lost that are seeking, but those that are in open rebellion. I have nothing but hatred for them. We don't gel. I can't love what they're doing. I can't. And by the way, and I can't even be neutral. I can't be neutral to it. Why? Because we're people of the way. We're people that God lives and reigns in us. And by the way, and God's not neutral to their sin. He's not as well. He's not neutral to their sin. Therefore, he doesn't call us to be neutral to their sin. While he loves the sinner, and by the way, you and I have read scripture before, that it's God's will, seek him while he can be found that God desires for those to turn to him. And that needs to be the desire for you and I. And by the way, that wicked, that the openly rebellion can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be transformed and set free by the power of the gospel. But the open rebellion, it's something that you and I have got to not develop a taste for, that we have to understand it goes contrary to what we are as a redeemed people and that we've got to make sure that in no way do we choose it to love the people in the way that Christ did, but stand up against the sin and have a visceral reaction to it, a visceral reaction to injustice, a visceral reaction to open rebellion against God. Why? Because we hate them? No, because we know what the end result of that is. And in love and mercy, we don't want that for them. Father, well, I pray that we've been faithful to the reading of your word. Oh God, if anything has been said, done, or thought that goes contrary to it, please erase it from our minds, from our memories, and from our experience. God, thank you that you don't hide 
our thoughts and our feelings in scripture. Thank you, Father, that we can come before you with our gut reaction, with our visceral reaction, and you take it, and you allow us to express that. But God, thank you that you don't leave us in our lost state. You don't even leave us in our confusion. But Father, that you bring clarity to us. You bring comfort to us. So Father, would you help us as your people to call sin, to see sin, to recognize sin, not to play with it, understand what it is, and to have a visceral hatred towards that. But, oh God, would you also help us to realize you are the God that loves the world and seeks all men to come to you. Thank you for that today. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.